Hello, everyone. Good day. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. My name is David Turner. I'm the Senior Director of Standards Development at the FIDO Alliance. And today I'm going to be diving into what pass keys are all about. Um, I'm sure you've been hearing the term a lot, wondering what all the pieces are, what it means, maybe what's changed if you're familiar with FIDO in the past, and I'm going to go through all of that today. So FIDO has been all about simpler, stronger authentication from the beginning. Uh, when people first started, they had keys and cards they had to use, and these things tended to be um, clumsy and cumbersome and uh, complicated to implement and complicated to use uh, uh, for use by the user. When FIDO in began introducing its standards back then, our focus was, and it still is today, open standards for simpler and stronger authentication using public key cryptography. So you know it's backed by some very strong crypto stuff. Uh, a big emphasis on it was that it was all based on a single gesture. So a single touch or fingerprint or face recognition. Um, it's possession based because you have the thing in your hand, whether it's a key or your phone. Um, and most importantly, it's, it's phishing resistant. So it provides a very secure way of doing authentication. So the big parts of what FIDO is all about is first it increases consumer increases security for uh, over consumer two-factor authentication um, most of the mechanisms used today uh, still rely upon um, uh, solutions that are phishing resistant both for the password as well as for the second factor and so a big part of, of what fido does is offering a multi-factor approach while being phishing resistant which sets it very far apart from the other alternatives. And it tends to be a better alternative to smart card solutions uh, because of the simplicity of deployment. It doesn't require a whole uh, complex uh, PKI infrastructure. It makes it easy to include people who are within and without your organization. Um, and so even in high-risk environments, FIDO provides a lot of benefits uh, over the traditional uh, two-factor solutions. But there were some challenges with scale. Um, there was, there's been a, a very high level of adoption. I know, for example, that one, um, you know, security key vendor is in the, you know, many, many millions of keys out there. And so we, we know that there's broad adoption. We know a lot of people are using it, but there's still some challenges because there are some challenges with uh, using physical security keys. Uh, one of the first ones is just the deployment of them. How do I get them to my end users? Um, if I'm an enterprise, I need to somehow deliver them, given how everyone's still, a lot of people are still working remotely. Um, if they're consumers, same deal. How do I get them into their hands? Or worse, do I have to ask them to pay for one? And on top of that, in order to protect yourself, you generally had to have a backup security key in case you lost the first one, which adds to, um, adds to costs for you know, whoever's paying for it. We moved forward um, from just supporting uh, physical security keys to the notion of authenticators that were embedded within the device. So within your phone or uh, within your laptop. And that took us forward in terms of usability and convenience uh, because now there wasn't the physical deployment necessary and it simplified the process for the end user. However, there was still a challenge um, where if you lost the phone or you lost the uh, laptop or it broke, then you lost the uh, credentials, the keys that you had created to work with relying parties. Uh, and so you would have to go back and, and set some of them up. There was no risk. Uh, if you lost those devices, you're not, you know, it, it's not that it's a security risk, it's a convenience issue. And then there's still this high barrier of adoption for the use of two-factor authentication. It's not a great usability story. Um, it, it still makes people stumble as they're moving along. They get confused about what needs to, be do, needs to be done, pardon me. And so what they end up doing is they just keep falling back to uh, passwords because frankly, for all the problems of passwords, people recognize it, they understand it, they know what it means. And even though it may not be the, a good solution, uh, it's what people end up falling back. Uh, falling back to. So we needed to find uh, solutions to all of these things. But we still haven't solved the main problem, and that is that passwords are still the primary way for logging on, and they are still easily fished through you know, social engineering and, and whatnot. And as I was saying, they tend to be very difficult to use and to maintain. And the consequences are real. The impact is real 
to the world at large. 81% uh, of hacking related breaches tend to be because of stolen or weak passwords. Um, a, a great quote I heard from someone was that um, these days, nobody hacks your account, they just log in. And that's because they're not necessarily beating on it. They may be using a stolen password they got from one of the unfortunately large number of data breaches that, that are out there. Um, you have people who give up on purchases because of the inconvenience. They abandon their uh, shopping carts because they, they've forgotten their password or they, get, they stumble on the two-factor bits. Um, and instead of trying to sort it out, trying to do a password reset, they just say, I'm done, and they walk away. And that's real money, right? The, the, the companies that are, um, you know, the, the relying parties that are trying to service their company, they're losing sales directly as a result of the challenges and inconveniences of using uh, passwords. And then there's direct financial loss from uh, phishing attacks and account takeovers. Uh, you know, we have a 76% uh, rise in, uh, so the number was already very large and we almost doubled it. Uh, so that's a dramatic increase in the number of, of financial, uh, increase in the losses due to financial account takeovers and the like. And ultimately, it all comes down to the notion that people are using weak passwords or they're using um, variations of the same password. Um, you know, they, they're forced to change their password every three months and they go from password one to password two and then password three, and then password four, which is a combination of both a bad password and a bad pattern for changing the password. So all of this combines to say that we still have a very serious problem just using passwords. And if we could just get people to stop using passwords all by itself, we'd be way farther ahead. So what if we could uh, replace that model? What if we could come up with, say, a password in something else that is more secure than a password solution and it's easier to use at the same time. And so if phishing resistance is still, well, I'll say phishing resistance on, and including with uh, data breaches are you know, the, the top level um, risks to these solutions, um, what can we do to come up with an answer that's better than uh, most two-factor solutions that are uh, still very fishable? And that's where we get pass keys. So, in simple terms, a passkey is just a FIDO credential. It's not a new thing as such. It's, it's the same FIDO credential based on cryptography that we've been you know, talking about and using for you know, the last 10 years. One of the new variations though, and I'll get into some of the benefits in this in a moment, but one of the uh, uh, changes is that uh, systems and um, applications now support the ability to synchronize your keys across devices so that it addresses some of the problem of backup and recovery, as well as the convenience of having the same credential available on multiple devices. So um, what exactly is um, a passkey? Going a bit deeper here. Um, it is any passwordless credential from FIDO, uh, and it raises the bar for both security and user experience. And it's not that the crypto has gotten better, it's because it has simplified the process so that people are moving away from weaker solutions. So this is how we, we improve the security. And as I've said a few times already, the usability comes into play um, because of um, it, it being a simpler process, not having two steps, and frankly, not having to actually remember and type in passwords as well. And in most solutions going forward, you will be able to synchronize uh, these credentials across devices, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, you can still use security keys. You can still have what we call device bound credentials, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. Uh, and they, they, those are features that are often required for, for much higher level um, security scenarios. Another term you may hear is something called a passkey provider. And it's really not a, a new concept. We've just taken something that's existed already, which is essentially the notion of a password manager, which today is already embedded within your platform, within your browser. Um, you know, you've got um, Google Password Manager, you've got iCloud Keychain, and you have third-party password providers that have been, or password managers have been around for, for many years that are now helping you manage your passkeys as well. And these are all called passkey providers. And by using a tool like this to manage the credentials, what it does is it makes it easier to get uh, set up. It simplifies account recovery because 
Um, they've already got those pr provisions in place for recovering all of this information. So if you lose a single device, if you only have one device and you lose it, um, they have systems in place to help you recover your account and therefore recover all the keys. So that's helped to deal with and directly address the problem of, say, losing a device. Um, you also have the benefit of being able to synchronize these credentials between your devices. So if I have my iPhone and I create a, a pass key to log into my banking site, um, and then I go over to my uh, iPad and I try to log into the same banking site through iCloud Keychain, that pass key has been synchronized so it's available on the iPad and it automatically works. So as an end user, I don't have to go and create one pass key on my iPhone and one pass key on my uh, my tablet or or my laptop, and the um, that synchronizing is generally provided by whoever's managing the pass keys themselves. Whether it's the platform, as I said, third party software, and we have live solutions of that today. Excuse me, companies like Apple, Google, Dashlane, One Password, LastPass, and so on. They all provide these capabilities, and they all support um, the use of them uh, pretty much across uh, all the ecosystems. Well except when you're Apple or Google and you're your own ecosystem. Um, so let me see where are we going here. So I'm going to walk through at this point how it works. For some of you, this may be a refresher. Um, some of you uh, may have seen some of this before. For some of you, it may be new. So the first thing to highlight is that instead of just having a username password in the FIDO flow, we've introduced this concept of an authenticator. And it can be a physical device, like the security key that I talked about, or it could be um, embedded into um, your, your, your computer or a phone, or it could be a third-party uh, passkey provider like um, you know, one of the, the password managers I mentioned earlier. And the key thing is that for every account that you connect to, again, let's go back to the bank I mentioned a moment ago, you create a, a private key which is controlled and maintained by the authenticator. So the authenticator maintains control of that private key all the time and doesn't share it with anybody else uh, outside of, of its own um, ecosystem. Uh, and then there's a public key that's created. And this is what's given to uh, the relying party, the service provider, the website that you're trying to connect with. And that's done as a part of the registration process. So you set this up for each of the accounts that you have. Now, a key part of this whole flow is that there's always this notion of a user of user verification, uh, that, that the process always requires um, some kind of notion of either presence or verification from the user. And this helps protect against uh, various internal attacks that may try and attack the authenticator itself and spoof it and get it to behave as if there were human there. But the, the systems are all designed so that uh, it requires some aspect of human user intervention, a gesture and whatnot. And it can include touching a key. It can include biometrics. It varies depending on the devices and the, 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 the solutions that you're using. Once those keys have been created and it's time to do authentication, what happens is that the service sends a challenge over to the authenticator. Um, the user verification or user presence takes place again. And what happens is the, uh, the private key that's stored in the authenticator signs the challenge, and then it sends that sign response back to the service provider. The service provider uses the public key that they got during registration to look at the message and to confirm that, yes, in fact, it came from the authenticator that was used to create the key in the very first place. A number of benefits of this without getting into details of the, the protocol are that one, it, it protects against man in the middle attacks. So if, if this is a, uh, you know, again, your banking site and some man in the middle tries to get in the middle of this challenge here, um, the, the protocol will recognize that the site that's trying to um, fish you is not the same site that was the one that um, you created the key for. So it protects against those man in the middle attacks. That's where the, the phishing uh, protection comes in. It also has means to protect against uh, replay attacks. And again, all of this is based on um, the use of, again, the public key cryptography, which means that if, if this database gets breached, there are no passwords to steal. Uh, nobody 
is going to be able to take your public key from, again, say my bank got breached and they got my public key for my account. They can't do anything with it. Um, there is no way that they could then attack my bank account using that same public key. So it's a very strong, very robust solution. The newest part, though, is that, as I was saying earlier, we now have this ability to synchronize the keys. So the authenticator can use a secure cloud solution, and these tend to be uh, secure end-to-end -end solutions, um, encrypted at rest, encrypted uh, in transit, um, and they provide the ability to um, synchronize the keys so that, in the example I said before, I create the key over on the phone, um, and after I've created it, it then becomes available on my other device so that I can log in with it. And even if I had only one device, uh, this link to the cloud, <clears throat> pardon me, is what will allow us to, um, to do the uh, account recovery so that your, your keys are all protected. Not gonna spend a, oops, screen shifted. That's my mistake, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, not sure what I did to the screen. Just wanna highlight very quickly that from a, a key standpoint, um, what things uh, look like. In general, uh, on the left, what you have is the synced passkey model where I created a key called A that I use again for my bank. And that key A is available on both my, uh, my, my machine as well as my phone. Um, you'll notice that there's these two other keys that I won't get into great detail on those right now. I won't get into detail at all, but there's these notions of device bound keys which are a way for an extra signal that the relying party can use to say, yes, I've, I've seen that device before. The good thing though, is that we, we now have um, the notion of um, device, or not, sorry, I'm sick. We continue to have the notion of device bound keys where you can have um, a physical key, a security key, like it shows here. Um, you will have another key, let's say in this device, another key in this device. And in many, high risk scenarios, it is very important that those keys be kept distinct. And the good news is that that's the solution that we've had from the beginning. And that continues to be um, what you might call the gold standard for the higher security models. So we now continue to support the old one, but we also have uh, this newer model. Another new innovation though, is the ability to do what we call cross device authentication. Um, the idea here is that let's say I've created the, um, uh, the key on my phone again, and it's an iPhone. And now I want to log into my bank on my Windows machine. Well, Apple doesn't synchronize the keys to the Windows machine. So what we have is the, the ability to, on my laptop, let's say my Windows machine, this QR code can pop up and I can take a picture with my phone. And what it does is it sets up a, a connection between the, the phone and the server through uh, the back channel on the phone. And it, um, it also uses uh, Bluetooth, not for any data transfer, but simply to check the location of the device, make sure it's actually in close proximity uh, to the machine that you're trying to log into. And this is another layer to help protect against uh, phishing attacks. And so this is a way of helping you uh, bridge between credentials you may have created in one environment and need to use for authentication in another environment. So, what we've got is the same, only more. We've got something that's even stronger than before. We've improved the usability and more importantly, it's way more scalable than it was before. Um, the original solution was uh, this, which continues to be uh, a very powerful approach, uh, very secure and um, uh, very, very reliable in uh, say high risk scenarios, but we've also got the ability to synchronize keys, which is cryptographically as secure as this, but has some extra conveniences and like uh, being able to synchronize between devices, being able to back up, being able to do cross, event, uh, cross device um, authentication. So going to go through uh, a few misunderstood things uh, about um, pass keys, uh, just to Clarify. So people say, are passkeys a new specification or a new standard from FIDO? And the answer is no. The cryptography and the, the core protocols underlying 
the use of pass keys are exactly the same. They are the same protocol. They are the same credentials. They are still using uh, WebAuthn in the browsers and on the platforms to do all of the uh, to do all the heavy lifting. So there's there's no new specification as such underneath. Our pass keys are vendor specific. So if I create one with uh, Apple, can I use it? Uh, you know, to log into a Google site? Absolutely. The vendors password managers, they support the use of pass keys, but the process again for signing in is based on these open standards, which are um, deeply supported across browsers and across operating systems so that you know that you have access to them on virtually every device that's out there now. The next one is, well, are all the passwords sync? I have a scenario where, you know, that's important that that not be allowed. Well, that's where, uh, you know, they don't. It's the short answer to that. They don't all have to be synced. There are a number of solutions for, for taking that approach. Um, some of the passkey providers can be configured so that they don't allow it. And again, you've always got the uh, ability to use the physical security key um, to, to house like what we call a device bound key. And then can pass keys only be used to log in on a phone? Of course, the answer there is no. Um, you can always create a pass key from my, I could create a new one for my Windows machine. I can create a new one for my iPhone, um, but um, you also have the ability now to synchronize across those devices. If I had two iPhones, uh, I could synchronize them. If I had two Android devices, I could sync between them. So, and in fact, a really cool thing is that Sony has recently started rolling out the use of pass keys with PlayStation 5. So when you log into your uh, um, PlayStation account, um, they're now supporting the ability of using pass keys. So it's not even about traditional computing, we're now getting into gaming consoles and uh, we expect to see this coming very soon with um, uh, smart TVs. If you're like me, you've got a million different services on your, 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 your TV. And if you go to switch to another TV or you know try and do anything, you've got to re-enter every single one and do that button thing for everyone, it's horrible. So pass keys will make that life, uh, make your life a lot simpler there. So finally, what are the big takeaways here? Um, FIDO credentials, WebAuthn credentials are phishing resistant. Um, we've added new features to improve account recovery and um, uh, avoid the problems of having to do password, <clears throat> pardon me, password resets. They're a superior alternative to most MFA uh, type solutions like one time passwords and the, li and the like. And um, it's drop in ready. If you want to build a solution today that takes advantage of pass keys, you can fundamentally rely on the fact that it will be available in the browsers and will be available in whatever operating systems you, you're using. And we're talking about now using this stuff at, at scale. We're talking, you know, billions of people now have access to this. And um, when Andrew speaks later on uh, today, you'll be talking a lot more about uh, password adoption. And at that point, do we have any, do we have time for questions? Don't know how long I rambled. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll take a couple questions, but I uh, just wanted to mention that David will be here for the AMA later. So we can take like, we'll do like two questions now, but then we'll, we'll be able to answer a bunch more later. Um, so David, thank you so much for that great presentation. A um, couple questions. I think you actually answered a few of these questions. So one of the questions was, do you have to have a cell phone to use pass keys? And I think that you you answered that question, which is no, it's not it's not a phone, just on phones. Um, and then the the other question is actually just with regard to um, the slide you showed with the FIDO authenticator. So the question is, are there security requirements that we put forth for those authenticators? You mean the strength of the authenticator? Yeah, or, like security certification is. The... Yeah, that's. I thought that you were asking. So yeah, yeah. Um, one of the, the the other things that FIDO does is it certifies uh, FIDO products, and uh, the security keys can actually come in different flavors of strength depending on what you're trying to protect against. So we have levels one, two, and three, um, and generally they're designed to protect against higher levels of attack. Uh, where level one is sort of your, your your standard level saying that they've taken the right steps to protect the, the keys in, in particular ways. Step two starts getting into uh, protection through you know physical hardware, uh, backing you know, guaranteed hardware that's backing the credentials. And at the, the top level, we're talking about 
physical security key protection. Like can someone hack the key open and, and get at the code sort of serious, serious attack le level. So, you know, very few people need it at that level, but that kind of security uh, keys um, is something that people can look at. Most scenarios only need level one. Um, some can, uh, will take advantage of level two again, when they've got a higher uh, risk model. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. There's a oh, there's a lot of good ones for later. We're not going to go into. There's a lot of questions. Uh, let's see. What would be? So you we talked about cross device authentication. Um, there's a question about um, the security of that of that uh, transport mechanism. Uh, can you do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the good news is that it's still FIDO. Um, even though we're using a QR code, the QR code only sets up the session um, so that the, the it, it gives the phone information to know which service provider to go talk to in the background. Um, it, it doesn't, uh, there, there's no um, communication of information as, as a, sorry, through the use of the QR code. Once the phone knows who to talk to, then it's just a FIDO transaction. It still has all the phishing protection built in, protection against man in the middle and so on. Um, and it, it still uses the same FIDO credentials. So that part doesn't change. The, the, the other QR code and Bluetooth are really just to help strengthen the, the whole process. Great, thank you, David. So I do, so as I mentioned earlier, David will be back later uh, for our question period AMA. And there are a lot of questions and they're really good. So I really appreciate everyone who took the time to put them in and we will be getting to them a little bit later on. So, but for now, let's um, let's say thank you to David, and we will see you a little bit later. Um, and we're just going to take a quick pause as we get ready for our next session um, with Intercede. <laughs>